Boker Tov. Good morning. Welcome back to Word of the Watchman, and I thank each of you for joining with me this morning. Interestingly enough, prior to reading Let This Mind Be in You, I never paid much attention to secular philosophy or folks like Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, even Sun Tzu or Confucius. Sure, I was aware of them and periodically heard some of their thoughts. However, the bottom line is that my interest has almost always been the things of Yah, His Word. As is my tendency, I've taken a deeper look into some of them and quite frankly, I've been unimpressed for multiple reasons. Mainly, they serve to remind me just how self-important man believes he is. Before getting into chapter 3, the Athenian history, let's take a moment to go to Yah in prayer. Heavenly Father God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we thank you. We praise you uh, for the blessing of this new morning. We thank you for restoring to us the breath of life. But Father, we pray uh, that you would create in us a clean heart and that you would renew a resolute and a right spirit within us uh, that we might be able to pursue a greater and deeper understanding of your word. Father, we pray for encouragement and strength, and we pray that you would touch each of us at whatever level of understanding we might be, so that we might receive whatever it is you have in store for us. We pray that you would allow your Ruach HaKodesh to govern, guide, and direct all that is said and done in this video. We give you all praise, honor, and glory in Yeshua's name. Amen. Immediately, our author Brad brings our attention to Socrates, the first of the revered Greek thinkers. Post-Peloponnesian War, around the 4th century before the Common Era, we had what came to be known as the Athenian Age, as the name would indicate Athens, Greece, was at the center of intellect and artistic expression. This was a period in Greek history which produced Socrates. Brad writes, According to most current encyclopedias, Socrates was the most influential thinker in the Western world. Socrates, although he wrote nothing of his own, was the progenitor of the philosophy that man's evil actions are caused by ignorance. Progenitor, he was a one who promoted, who pushed forward uh, the uh, philosophy that man's evil actions are caused by ignorance. That first statement, that first idea, concept that Brad has shared with us points to a problem that we have here even today. The idea that each of us as individuals lack responsibility for those things we do. I don't go along with that any more than I believe that Brad did. There are some evil, sinful, wrong actions that people take due to ignorance. But there are also some that are malicious and willful that we choose to do. Not we as in I, but we as in mankind. We see that inductive reasoning was introduced by this famous philosopher when he developed something known as the Socratic method. The idea centers around reasoning 
from particular facts to a general idea as stated by our author. He goes on to write the following. This is referred to as inductive reasoning. Reasoning from particular facts to a general idea. In theory, this seems logical. But all the reasoning depended upon what was considered a fact. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. What was considered to be a fact. I consider this word, the scripture, to be full of fact. There are others that consider this scripture to be factually inaccurate, mythological, false. The point that I'm trying to bring up is that is a whole or I can't think of the particular word. That's a problem with that concept because the reality is if you start from a point where your fact is in error, it's impossible for you to draw a correct or truthful conclusion. I find that happening a lot today as well. Just look at the political environment. Look at the social environment. Look at the concept, which I believe is just a concept and not a reality, of racism. There's only one race, the human race. There's plenty of ethnicities, which is based on the environment that a particular person's ancestry originated from. But even that fact leads to erroneous conclusions so-called fact. He continued, life was based upon thoughts and ideas to be debated. Many of the testimonies of Socrates' students attested to the fact there were rarely any conclusions drawn, but everyone looked forward to the next debate. <laughs> it's kind of comical to me because I have occasion, not all of them, not even many of them, but occasion, some of them, I have occasion to look at, um, to watch uh, campaign debates at various levels, but I don't find any of them to be worth much. <laughs> and they don't draw too many conclusions either. In fact, it's kind of a mud throwing contest. It's, uh, it's kind of a contest of one upsmanship or however you want to uh, phrase that where here, this, this, this will top what you just said. Well, no, this will top what you just said. What's the importance of any of it? Cause the reality is there's a lot of, um, what do you call it? Um, promises made. Not too many of them are kept. But anyways, let's stick with this. Unlike most folks of renown or fame, Socrates was not wealthy. He wasn't even rich. And yes, there is a distinction between the two. When we talk about someone being rich, There's quite a number of rich people in the world today. For all I know, always has been. You have rich coaches, athletes, so-called celebrities, entertainers, politicians, business folks, real estate folks. Rich is something that 
it's usually, it's normally relatively recent. It doesn't have much depth to it, usually. Now, wealth, on the other hand, is something that has deep roots. It's something that has staying power, as they say. Wealth is something that is often passed, most often passed from generation to generation to generation. You get to the second, third, fourth, fifth generation, they didn't have anything to do with building that financial position that the family finds itself in or a particular individual found him or herself in. But it's something that lasts. In fact, you can apply that to things other than finances. This individual has a wealth of knowledge. This individual has a wealth of experience and so forth. In fact, when we talk about Socrates, he lived in poverty and disdained material possessions. As alluded to earlier, Socrates believed that no one knowingly did evil. One thing Brad relayed to us at this point stuck out for me. The fact that Socrates taught that one should rely on his own moral intellect to lead a happy life. I hope you've been paying close attention to the underlying theme that we find in this entire text. And we find in the path that man, humankind, has decided to chart for itself. And that which underlies all of this is an effort, a conspicuous effort, to undermine the words, the ways, the concepts, the precepts of our Creator God. I have this saying that I often use. In fact, I just used it yesterday. <laughs> my wife is my witness. If the world is going that way, Mark Stephen McKinney's going that way. Well, with regard to what we're talking about here, if the ways of Hashem are over there, then the ways of the world are headed over there, as directed by the one who has poisoned this world, the adversary. It's through his inspiration that man comes up with these so-called moral, this uh, moral intellect and all these types of things. And I may touch on some of this later. I may not, you know, short-term memory. I might even forget in two minutes that I even talked about that. <laughs> and if it's not in the script, good chance it's not coming up again, but that's okay. I won't be defeated by that. This idea one should rely on his own moral intellect to lead a happy life brought to mind a scripture for me. It's not in the text, but it's one that uh, I believe is appropriate here. It comes from the book of Mishle or Proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 and 6. Verse 5, trust in Adonai, the Lord, with all your heart, do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, then he will level your paths. That concept, that quote that we had before from Socrates says that you are to rely on self. Remember I talked at the beginning about self-importance and so forth. Well, the word clearly 
teaches us that in all of our ways, in every area, in our home, on our job, in our sport, in whatever endear it, how we raise our children, how we relate to one another. In all of our ways, acknowledge him and he will level our paths. In other words, he will direct us in an even way, not even according to our perception, but even according to his ways. So that we'll end up in the place that he designs for us to end up. Such as this divine appointment right now of you watching this video that I and my wife have created. As just a small example. Toward the end of this section on the father of Greek philosopher Socrates, Brad tells us, Socrates, like many before him, sought wisdom no matter where it came from. You might recall in previous videos, I introduced an idea called learning how to eat chicken. I'm not going to say that I have any issue with this, but what I will say is I doubt very seriously that most who follow this idea do it the way that I do it. Do it the way that I've been taught to do it. You know, like eating chicken. I spoke earlier that I looked into this stuff. I found a whole lot of bones and maybe a morsel or two of meat. You need to learn how to eat chicken by learning how to find the meat, eat the meat, consume the meat, and throw away the bones. I do that in my research. I do that in my study. There's other materials that I dig into. There's dictionary definitions that I utilize. And I, I have any number of dictionaries around me, I probably have five, six, seven, it's, uh, and it's not because I'm this big f fan of studying dictionaries, but I have a fascination with old dictionaries. And so I collect them. Just like, you know, I collect other things. <laughs> uh, they call it picking. But anyways, um, so I like to look in these different definitions and see how definitions have changed for particular words over the course of time. I have some dictionaries that go back a long time. But you need to learn how to eat chicken. And so this... Uh, seeking after wisdom no matter where it came from I don't seek after wisdom no matter where it comes from but as I seek knowledge I seek it using the concept that I just described Socrates prized student was a man known as Plato and he would be the one to introduce the world to the demurge, which we will hear more about from Brad a bit later. Brad titled this next section in his text, Plato, the beginning of the end. So we're going to transition from discussion of Socrates to a discussion of Plato, the student of Socrates. He starts off the section with the following. As we begin to enter the Hellenistic era of the evolution of Western thought, we come to the basic fork in the road. Socrates' most famous student is going to take Greek philosophy to its most respected heights. A couple things here. 
when we talk about a Western way of looking at things or Greek thought, we're talking about Hellenism. And when we talk about Hellenism, we're talking about injecting or actually observing, perceiving a way of life, a way of living, a road map for life, which comes from Greek culture. When it talked about a fork in the road, those of us who are redeemed by Hashem, we've accepted His Son and the free gift that He provided through His death, burial, and resurrection, His death on the stake. And keep in mind, the focus should not be the death. You know, you see all these crosses people wear, and uh, some belief systems have crosses where there's a figure, an image attached to it. First of all, those shouldn't exist, uh, uh, you know, from a scriptural standpoint. From a secular standpoint, I guess it's normal. I see enough people wearing them. But... The focus should not be his death. I don't often hear about the focus being his burrow, but it, it shouldn't be that either. The focus should be his resurrection and what that represents. He conquered the grave. He conquered death. He paid a price. And the price he paid was for all of us, because each of us, based on the sin nature of mankind, we all deserve death. But he paid that price. That we might have a right to eternal life. Not that we might all have eternal life, because not all of us are going to have eternal life. Some of us are going to have eternal death, experience the second death. But that we might have a right to eternal life. I've accepted that gift, and so I've accepted that right. It's my prayer that each of you have done the same, and if you have not, that you will. So once you do that, you've made your choice on in that fork in the road that each of us come to. Now, if you choose not to accept that free gift, you're going to constantly come to forks in the road. Choices to be made about right or wrong and this, that, or the other. Now, we all have choices in terms of right and wrong. But for those of us who have chosen the ways of Hashem, remember what I said earlier about allowing Him to direct our paths. In essence, I don't have to make a choice. I've already made the choice to follow him. And in making that choice, he's leveling and directing my path. So I'm being obedient to him and following him and his ways according to his word. It's at this point that Brad begins to reveal the point behind the section title when he writes, This is where we will spend some time revealing what we really mean when we speak of Greek thought. Now, I gave just a little hint of it here a moment ago, but as usual, Brad does a much more thorough and better job then I believe I'm even capable at this point. In stark contrast to his mentor, Plato, Plato was a member of the social elite. As our author goes on to inform us, 
This was part of the background of Plato's most powerful contribution to religious thought, the dualism of man. Now, there's a problem just from the get-go. <laughs> How is it that a philosopher, a secular philosopher, would even have a powerful contribution, would have any contribution to so-called religious thought. Well, as much as I want to, I'm not going to dive deep into that. I'm going to kind of let it go for now. And besides, if you looked at some of my other videos, you probably already know what my thoughts are on that. But nonetheless, with regard to religious thought, the dualism of man. That was contributed by Plato. Here's what Brad wrote. Plato taught that man consisted of two parts, the soul and the flesh. He taught that only the soul was good, and good is what all men seek. The flesh was evil and could do no good. He thought since the body was just a passing phase of our cosmic existence, all that mattered was soul. Because only the soul would be involved in the future. Only the soul could do good. So what the body did was virtually irrelevant. Now, I'm going to talk about something coming up here momentarily that Brad wrote that comes directly from the words of Plato. But what I would say about this last part, so what the body did was virtually irrelevant. Hone in on that. Because that whole concept has really come alive here of recent vintage. It's, it's always amazing to me that when we think of Hashem knowing the end from the beginning, He knew that we would be at this stage. He knew that we would repeat the mistakes, the ways that were made back then. And it happened, it repeated itself in Rome. And it repeated itself in subsequent empires, as, as they call them. Places of, of um, power, places of influence, and so forth. The idea that the flesh was evil and could do no good... So, it's through the flesh that we're born into this world. We're brought into this world. What's evil about that? I think that's good. Every life that is allowed to come forth because we know what's happening. We know what all this fuss has been about here lately. There's been thousands, if not millions, probably more like millions of lives that have not been allowed to come into this world. But each life that is allowed to come into this world represents potential. The potential for something fantastic to happen through the life of that individual. And I'm not going to get too deep off into those weeds either. But the flesh is capable of both evil and good, both right and wrong. Sin and lack of sin. Living righteous or living unrighteous. The flesh is capable of all of that. 
So that premise in and of itself is off the mark. It's inaccurate. It's a fact that you don't want to start from because you're going to draw a false conclusion. <laughs> Not everyone was capable of grasping that concept, or so he thought. And only the people of the higher class known as the guardians could. They belonged to the educated class, trained to live in what were known as shared houses, cities. They would eat in the same mess halls, restaurants. And their children were to be raised as a group in a common environment by special caretakers. The equivalent of what we would think of as public schools or more accurately today's equivalent, a private school. But the idea of formal mass education. Now, I'm not sure how many of you know this, but that is in direct conflict with the ways of Hashem. The way of Hashem is that the education of children should be conducted by parents. Once the foundation has been established by the parents, beginning at a young age, as modeled in Israel, Then you begin to have some outside influence of trusted individuals, such as rabbis. Or, in our case, those who are teachers and well um, and, and knowledgeable in the ways of Hashem based on his word. But the most important point is that it was to be conducted by the parents. What comes next set off all kinds of alarm bells. Only this ruling class possessed the knowledge to determine policies and to make decisions which determined who was to be allowed to mate with whom to produce the best children? Brad writes, does this sound familiar? Now, I wrote a note here in the script, and I'm just going to read it to you verbatim. <laughs> As I said early on, you know, I mentioned something to my wife, and I wrote a note here. Stay on point here, Mark. <laughs> When I talk about alarm bells, I, I, I wrote it that way because there are so many signs. Stop. Don't go there. <laughs> There's so many signs that popped up, you know, when I read this. I'm just going to read it again. I'll read through it fast. Only this ruling class possessed the knowledge to determine policies and to make decisions which determine who was to be allowed to mate with whom to produce the best children. I am just going to mention a name or two. Hitler. Stalin. Socialism, and so forth. You get where I'm going with this. Now, that's all well and good because that's somewhere else. That's another era. I hope you don't believe that because you need to open your eyes and look around. This is subtly happening now. Today, in this environment, all over the Western world, but as it concerns you and me here in this country. So I'm going to stay on point and I'm not going to go any deeper into that. This isn't about me. This is about Brad and his work. But I concur with what Brad speaks on. 
Excuse me. Otherwise, I wouldn't be sharing it with you. <laughs> knowledge was key to everything, and not everyone had access to this knowledge. Plato brought forth the nation of thinkers, where knowledge was the key to everything. If you have or would have studied, researched, Many of the things I have about different organizations, about different groups, some known, some not so well known, on purpose. What I just read would make all the sense in the world to you. This led to the era of Gnosticism. And if you think that is an old blast from the past, a long gone ideology, you would be wrong. It's all around you. It's covered up pretty well. The average person doesn't even understand the precept or the concept of it, so, so much of it is out in the open, but it's still hidden through lack of knowledge and understanding. Brad also states that Multitudes of mystery cults would come forth from this philosophy. Life was intellectualized and only for the initiated. It's no wonder that fraternities, sororities, and all kinds of groups claiming to have hidden or secret knowledge spring forth from this secular philosophy. Have you heard of the skull and bones? For one of the Ivy League schools. I'm not going to say which one because I think I know which one, but you know, I don't want to be factually incorrect. This is alive and well, and the roots, the origins of these things which I just mentioned come from Greek thought, Western thought, Hellenism. I agree with Brad when he tells us life consisted of abstract metaphysical concepts. This is why I am personally very skeptical of turning the simple commands of God into abstract concepts. Now, Brad is not saying that he believed life consisted of abstract or that he, yeah, that he believed life consisted of abstract metaph metaphysical concepts. That's what Plato promoted. The part that I agree with that Brad was stating, this is why I am personally very skeptical of turning the simple commands of God into abstract concepts. Now when you go and sit in your pews on Sunday morning, you're going to hear a lot of abstract concepts. Remember we talked a little bit earlier about Plato having a, a powerful contribution to religious thoughts. There you have it. That's a major part of it. You see, when Hashem inspired through his Ruach HaKodesh, his Holy Spirit, for the scriptures to be written, <clears throat> excuse me, and for his words to be shared, he did it in a concrete fashion. If you pay attention to it, he always uses nature. Always. He uses nature. And he does that for the reason that you can look out and actually see. You don't have to imagine, you can see what's being talked about. You can experience. In many cases, you can get your hands on it. But what Hashem uses is concrete. The foundation you talk of, he talks about, you build your foundation on rock. You don't build it on sand. You can go out and pick up a rock. You can go out and see a rock. You can put sand in your hand and watch it flow through your fingers.
there is some stable potential, but in its essence, it's not stable. It's not something you would want to build something permanent, something eternal on. Concrete, not abstract. This is actually a great pausing point, so I'll pick up at this point when we conclude our review of Chapter 3. When we continue in Part 2 of Chapter 3, Brad will go deeper into the idea of the demerge. So, as always, for those of you who would like to get your personal copy of let this mind be in you. Go to Brad and Carol's site at www.wildbranch.org. And if you can't, for whatever reason, get your own copy, contact me via email. We'll communicate, and I'll get you a copy. I have... Oh, uh, six, seven, eight, whatever over there. And I'll get more if I need to. I have no problem doing that. It would be an honor to do that, to share it with you. Shalom Aleichem. Be blessed this day.